All right, so welcome back for today's session of the Cardiff Analysis Seminar. So today we're in person, at least some of us are here. And we're delighted to have Ian Wood from University of Kent, um, who will talk about the spectrum of Maxwell equations for the flat interface between homogeneous dispersive media. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and taking the long journey for the British <laughs> Railway Network. Um, and uh, over to you. Okay, uh, that's right. Thank you very much for the, uh, the invitation and the introduction. Yes, it's, uh, it was a, a longer journey than planned yesterday, but uh, yeah, I made it in the end. Uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Um, so this is uh, joint work with uh, Malcolm Brown, Thomas Donald in Halle and Michel Plum in Karlsruhe. Um, so it's stuff that we're, well, we're still writing up basically. So this is the first airing of this. So uh, if anyone has any comments on it, then they're, they're very welcome at this point. And uh, yeah, up until well, I think the last week before Christmas, we were still having joint meetings with all of us on, on Zoom. So, uh, anyway, um, so this is roughly uh, uh, an outline of what I want to talk about. So I'll first say, uh, talk about the time harmonic Maxwell equations I'm going to be looking at. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, 1D and 2D reductions that we're going to make. So we're going to uh, uh, look at models, which are a bit easier to deal with. I'll then talk uh, a bit generally about operator pencils and their spectrum. Um, and then I'll uh, talk about results uh, for the 1D case mainly. Um, and I'll try and give some, uh, some outline of the proof there. Um, and we'll see, well, there's, a, there's an exceptional set which appears and the, the reduced set is the, the complement of the exceptional set. So, uh, so those things will play a bit of a role. And uh, if there's time at the end, um, then I might talk about the 2D case results. Okay, so uh, we've got Maxwell's equations for the, uh, the electric field and the magnetic field and the, uh, the electric displacement field B and the magnetizing field H, right, which uh, we're going to assume take the following form. So the mu naught and the epsilon naught are, are going to be constants, um, but we do have um, this additional uh, uh, function in here, um, where the, the chi hat is called the electric susceptibility, right? And um, so for an example that uh, people quite like looking at, uh, we've got a, an example of the chi one hat here. So um, the, uh, well, two points to make. The first thing is we're going to assume that in terms of spatial uh, dependency it only depends on the x1, right? So we're actually going to have an interface between two materials at x1 equals zero. Um, and um, the omega is, of course, the, the spectral parameter that we, we sort of started out with. And we're going to assume that uh, in some of the, the materials, the, the properties are going to be uh, frequency dependent. So for the so-called brood model of a metal, for example, um, the, uh, the function would take this form. And we see that, of course, uh, there are singularities of the denominator here. So that's this set S uh, that we're excluding, right? So we're not allowing that, or excluding the singularities of the type one hat. Okay, um, so what we're going to do is we're, we're now going to reformulate it as a second order problem, right? We're going to look at a second order equation for the uh, electric field. And so then the equations look like this, right? So I should probably start with the W tilde. So the W tilde is epsilon naught mu naught times this, uh, this omega dependent uh, part of the function. And because uh, the condition was the divergence of the, the B field should be zero, um, that then becomes the divergence of the W tilde times E has to be zero. And in the, uh, the actual uh, second order equation for the E field, we have curl curl E minus W E is zero where the W is just omega squared times the W tilde. Okay, now, um, so we said that the, uh, the chi can have some uh, singularities, uh, so we want to exclude them. So we denote the set uh, uh, without the singularities of the chi as the domain of the W tilde. 
And um, there's something which probably from the physics point of view, we might not be that interesting, but mathematically uh, is something that we did actually look at a bit. Um, so there's a difference between the functions W and W tilde, essentially just as omega equals zero, right? So but if omega is a fixed frequency, which is non-zero, then of course the properties of W and W tilde will be basically the same. Um, but if omega is zero, then um, well, obviously the, the W is then quite different from the W tilde potentially, and in particular the W tilde could have a singularity at zero, which is cancelled out by the omega squared term. Okay, and so, as I said, we're going to assume we have an interface at uh, x1 is equal to zero, and we're going to assume that uh, in terms of the space, the material is homogeneous in each of the two half planes, right? So that means that the W tilde and the W rather than, oh, as functions of the two variables, we can uh, reduce it to two different functions of one variable in each of the half planes. So this is the W tilde plus minus and the W plus minus, which are then just functions of omega. Right, and well, uh, we'll get into the interface conditions in a bit more detail later, but basically because, of course, if the W and the W tilde have discontinuities across the interface, then um, that is going to uh, impose interface conditions on, uh, on the field E here to lie in the, uh, the domain of the appropriate operator. Yeah. Yes, yes, this is all scalar value. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, um, that's correct, yes, and the, the W tilde, the, the divergence condition is basically just a divergent condition on E except at the interface where you get a, a, some kind of jump condition. Okay, so uh, the one dimensional reduction that I want to look at is that I'm going to assume that the E field, so actually I'm going to look at a family of one dimensional reductions parameterized by K, so I'm going to assume the E field uh, is this exponential in the X2 variable times a function that just depends on the X1 variable, right, for fixed real K. And so then the, the equation that we're looking at, uh, so the, the curl, curl operator, uh, once uh, you apply it to this kind of E field, we're going to get uh, this operator T here, or maybe I should say expression. So, uh, when it's just the expression and I'm not worrying about domains, that's going to be called TK. Um, we'll get back to domains in a little bit, All right? So the TK is basically just the curl K, curl K operator, and this curl K operator is, well, well the, I guess the gradient K operator, I should call it here, uh, is uh, just uh, uh, this operator here, where obviously the uh, the derivative with respect to the x2 variable just gets replaced by ik, and uh, it's independent of the x3 variable. Okay. Um, and for the two-dimensional reduction that we'll look at, so there, here we allow then uh, fields that depend in any way on the x1 and the x2 variable, but it's still going to be independent of x3, and in that case then our equation looks like this. So uh, we've got, uh, well, more or less the usual gradient, right, but just with the two variables in it, and then the, the curl-curl operator corresponding to that expression is given by this, uh, uh, this matrix T here. Okay. There is no, no. So, um, I mean, one might want to do Fourier transforms in one direction later on, but basically, uh, if we have a function E that we're putting in the equations like this, then uh, there's no K here, right? So, so we're not taking a, some kind of Fourier transform in either of the variables for the 2D reduction. Okay, so, um, we're going to 
Well, we want to look at spectral properties of this problem, and uh, we're going to model it by an operator pencil, right? And um, we're going to be looking at families of operators which uh, depend effectively on two variables, right? Um, so the omega is the omega that we've seen before, right? But we also introduce for some cases, it's going to be useful to have a, an extra auxiliary uh, parameter, which is the lambda here, right? But uh, so our problem we're going to assume can be written as uh, in terms of two operators A and B, which depend on omega, where the A is going to be a closed operator from a domain D omega uh, into some range space R, and the B of omega is going to be a bounded operator um, from, well, at least defined on the D omega, um, into the range space R. So in the example that we're looking at, oops, repair that later, the, the A is going to be the curl-curl operator, right, and the B is just multiplication by the, uh, the W function. So that's what we're going to be looking at later. Um, so I think I've basically mentioned this, right? So the, the omega is really the spectral parameter we're interested in. Lambda will be fixed at one for most of the discussion, right? But there are some, some spectral concepts that we'll be looking at later, like isolated eigenvalues, uh, which will actually be isolated in terms of the lambda parameter rather than the omega parameter. Right, and uh, well, one thing to stress is that also the domain of these operators can be omega dependent, and it will be in um, in our case, right? Because well, the domain is going to include the divergence condition, and that depends on omega. Ah, okay, and so just so maybe as a motivation for uh, bringing in this additional spectral parameter lambda, right? So if our domain is not contained in the range space, and in our case it won't be, um, then of course it does not make sense to look at an expression like uh, the operator minus mu times the identity because the identity is not going to map between the appropriate spaces, right? Whereas uh, if we subtract multiples of B, then we will end up in the space that we want to end up in. Okay, so um, the resolvent set of the pencil is now going to be uh, the, the set of omegas such that P of omega and one is bijective with a bounded inverse, right? Or in other words, um, if we think of just the operator P of omega one, uh, I want zero to be in the resolvent set of that operator, Right, and then of course the spectrum, the complement is going to be the set where zero is in the spectrum of the operator P omega one. Um, so we're going to try and analyze all kinds of parts of the spectrum here. So we're going to be interested in the point spectrum, um, which is uh, what you'd expect, right? So the point spectrum consists of those omega where the, the operator P of omega one has a non-trivial kernel. And then we're going to be interested also in the, um, the multiplicity of eigenvalues. And so we've got a finite and infinite multiplicity eigenvalues. And um, the multiplicity that we're, we're looking at here is the, uh, the algebraic multiplicity, right? So uh, this is giving us the number of, uh, of eigenfunctions and all of the, the corresponding root functions or vectors as well that we're, we're counting here for the multiplicity. It's a turn out actually in, in what we're doing that the algebraic and the geometric multiplicity coincide anyway. Right, um, now one of the main tools we're going to be using are vial sequences to get at parts of the spectrum. So the vial spectrum uh, consists of those, uh, those omega, um, such that a vial sequence exists and a vial sequence is a, a sequence of functions um, which are normalized in the, uh, the domain space. Uh, they converge weakly to zero and such that if we apply the operator to them, um, then that is going to converge strongly to zero in the range space. Okay. 
Um, so nothing really unusual here. The only thing that may be slightly uh, different is that we're, we're using two different spaces here, right? So I'll operate on a pencil in principle maps from one space H into another space R. Right, now we're going to be interested in different parts of the essential spectrum um, in this situation. Right, so um, if you have a non self adjoint operator, um, then there are various definitions of the essential spectrum. Um, so you could find this, for example, in the book by uh, Edmund and Evans. Right, and um, so we also want to look at these in our context here. And um, so the first four are reasonably straightforward. Right, so we're saying that uh, the omega is in the, the first form of the essential spectrum, so the sigma E1, if, and now we're just looking at the P of omega 1 as an operator, is not semi fred -hole. All right, so um, it would be semi fred -hole, or if it is semi fred -hole, that means the range is closed, and either it's kernel or it's co-kernel is finite dimension. Right, and then for, for the other three, uh, we start to uh, impose less and less conditions on um, what P of omega one is, right? Or more conditions of what it not, should not be. So for the, the second version, it's semi fred home operators. But now the kernel has to be finite dimensional, right? It's not just not the kernel or the co-kernel anymore. It's the kernel has to be finite dimensional. In the third version, the kernel and the co-kernel both have to be finite dimensional. And in the fourth version, the dimensions of the kernel and the co-kernel have to coincide, right? So that means it's then going to be a fred -hole operator with index zero. Right, so those all generalize uh, very straightforwardly um, from the usual definition for operators. The fifth definition is a little bit weird, um, possibly. And this is where one where the, the parameter lambda uh, comes in again. So in the fifth version of the essential spectrum, if uh, one is not in this set delta for the uh, family P of, so now we fix an omega and we're looking at lambda as the spectral parameter, right? And this set delta consists of connected components of uh, like the lambda or in the lambda plane now where the P of omega lambda is semi Fredholm and that contain uh, a point of the resolved set, right? So um, again, this is, if you like, in some ways, just a gen or generalization to this situation of the, the standard definitions of all these versions of the essential spectrum. Okay, um, so a few comments on that. Um, so, well, I guess the first four inclusions from, from what I said are absolutely obvious, right? Um, but the, the sigma E5 is the largest of these five forms of the essential spectrum. Um, if you're only interested in self adjoint operators, you don't have to worry about all these distinctions, right? All of the definitions coincide. Um, but um, our problem is not going to be self adjoint in general. So, uh, you do have these distinctions potentially. Um, and for separable infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, the second version of the essential spectrum uh, coincides with the Weyl spectrum. So we can use Weyl sequences uh, to determine the, the second version. Put this back on again. Okay, and um, right, we'll see in a moment why maybe uh, this is going to be interesting. So we also want to talk about discrete spectrum, right? Um, so um, th this is a point that may be uh, a bit strange. I don't know, maybe other people come across this for operator pencils and if they have, there's a more standard way of doing this. If anyone knows about it, please let me know. Um, but we're going to say that omega is in the discrete spectrum of the pencil if and only if one is in the discrete spectrum. Now, uh, 
of the operators P of omega uh, with parameters. So that means that lambda equals one needs to be an isolated eigenvalue of finite algebraic multiplicity of the uh, eigenvalue problem A omega U equals lambda B omega U. All right, so if we do this, uh, this does not mean uh, that the omega in the discrete spectrum is in any way isolated from other points in the spectrum of the pencil, right? Because it's the discreteness is referring to the lambda variable and not the omega variable. So if you think of a very trivial situation where uh, you don't actually have any omega in, uh, dependence here, right? Then um, either all points in the complex plane are going to be in the discrete spectrum or none of them are. Right, depending on whether one is an isolated eigenvalue of the corresponding uh, lambda eigenvalue problem. All right, but uh, Yes. So, so the problem is, right, so this goes back to, to what I had, where was it? So this goes back, I think, to, to this problem here, right? So of course you can say zero is an isolated eigenvalue of P omega one, but then uh, in what sense? You, because you can't subtract some multiple of the identity from the P omega one, right? You have to subtract multiples of B from P omega one. Well, but if you want to talk about it being isolated, then you need to talk about everything in the neighborhood as well. So um, that then doesn't work. Where were we here? Right, so uh, one nice thing uh, about this is that um, uh, the, the proof that the this whole spectrum is then the disjoint union of the discrete spectrum and the fifth part of the essential spectrum. Uh, so this uh, is a result which I think uh, in the operator case goes back to 100 mark and the, um, at least that's where we first found it. Um, this is still true for the, the operator pencil here. Right, and so in many cases, it might be, well, it's going to be easier to determine whether um, an omega is in the discrete spectrum than whether it's in the sigma E5 set. Right? But in many ways, this is just because both of these are still defined with respect to the lambda parameter rather than the omega parameter. And so that allows us to, to still have that. Okay, um, so let's look at uh, the 1D case, right? So our uh, operator pencil is now we're going to call LK, right? And this consists of these operators LK of omega and lambda. And uh, well, the LK is the curl K, curl K operator, and the B is the multiplication operator by the W, right? And where the, uh, the lambda K is given by this, uh, this expression here. Um, right, and because in most of it, we're going to fix the, uh, the lambda to be one, so to save some space, if there's only one argument in the LK, uh, then that's going to mean that the second argument is one. Right, so the, the space H that we've got is just the, what you'd expect, right? The L2 space of functions on the real line with values in C3. Um, and this BK omega is now going to be the domain. Um, so we want all functions in the L2 space such that the curl K and the uh, curl K curl K are both in the space and such that the divergence condition is satisfied, right? So the, the only omega dependence actually comes through the divergence condition. Um, but that is, is built into the domain, right? And the range space is going to consist of those functions in the space such that the, uh, the divergence of the function is zero, right? And so um, we note that the, uh, the domain is not actually contained in the range because of the divergence conditions. 
right? So the domain requires doubling till the times u to be have be divergence free rather than u itself to be divergence free. Um, we basically because uh, well, if we go back to the the one D system, or oh, sorry, they're not, you go back to the, the first order system, then that's one of the uh, um, quantities that needs to that we want to have in the space. That's a, that's a choice we're making, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so I mentioned interface conditions earlier, so uh, here they are explicitly, uh, right? So uh, maybe if I just go back to the previous screen uh, to make it clear, right? So on the previous screen, we have various functions that uh, were effectively U or combinations of derivatives have to lie in L2 of the whole real line, right? And now on the next page, we're saying, well, we can write this set. So the U is going to consist of two components, U plus and U minus in each of the half planes, right? And so we require um, that the relevant derivatives in each of the half planes lie in L2. And then we additionally need uh, the interface condition at x1 is equal to zero, right? So these uh, these double brackets here just denote the, uh, if you like, the jump of the function uh, from the left to the right. And so uh, from the divergence condition, we get, for example, that the w tilde times the first component uh, mustn't jump, right? And from um, very, well, other parts being in uh, in the L2 space, uh, give us uh, these additional conditions. So U3 and its derivative mustn't jump, right? U2 and this combination, U2 prime minus IK U1 mustn't jump, right? So basically this comes from, so these functions in the brackets need to be in H1 of the whole space, which you can also then formulate in this, this way. It's, con it's a continuity condition across the interface. Okay, um, so uh, we've, I mentioned at the beginning, we've got what we call the exceptional set, which is this omega naught, and that's going to consist of those omegas where either the W plus or the W minus vanishes, right, which is probably uh, not very physical apart from uh, the case where omega itself is zero, right, so remember the W plus and W minus were omega squared times the W tilde, Right, so when omega is zero, um, we expect that to lie in this set. Um, but at least from a mathematical point of view, we can also look at the case when uh, we might have a material where in one of the half planes, the W actually itself vanishes. Right, and mathematically, this leads to, to some interesting uh, things that we'll see later. Okay, so the, the reduced spectrum and the reduced resolvent set are just going to be defined as the spectrum and the resolvent set outside of the exceptional set. Um, and so now I'm going to introduce some of the sets that we need to describe the spectrum. So an important role is played by uh, this equation here. So k squared times the sum of the w's is equal to the product of the w's. Right, and so with that, we're going to look at these three sets in particular. Uh, so we've got the M plus and minus set. Uh, so this consists of the omegas where the W plus or the, for the plus and the W minus for the M minus lie in K squared infinity. Right, and the um, NK set consists of those omegas where the W plus and the W minus are not in the the interval k squared infinity, um, but where they do satisfy this equality three. All right, so basically uh, the idea here is that we're going to get, oh, so all of these are going to be in the spectrum. Essentially the M plus 
is uh, coming from stuff that happens at plus infinity, the m minus is coming from stuff that happens at minus infinity, and this nk set here is going to be the one that comes from the interface. Okay, so uh, I've just repeated the definition of the sets at the top. So for the reduced spectrum in one dimension, we've got that the, the set nk um, gives you the whole point spectrum. Um, and in fact, all of the, uh, the eigenvalues are algebraically and then of course also geometrically simple. Right. Um, whereas the sets, uh, the m plus, Together with the m minus, that's going to give us the vial spectrum. Um, the discrete spectrum is just going to be given by the set of nk. So these are uh, these uh, simple eigenvalues are all going to lie in the discrete spectrum in the uh, in the lambda sense, if you like. Um, then um, the whole reduced spectrum can be written as a disjoint union of the vial spectrum and uh, the discrete spectrum, right? So, of course, that gives us that the, the whole reduced spectrum is just the union of these three sets here. And so, in particular, we get that uh, for the reduced spectrum, all of the, uh, the different essential spectra actually coincide, and given by the union of the M plus and the M minus. Okay, um, so just a couple of remarks. So this set NK, uh, we had this, uh, this equality three that I had earlier, right? In fact, if you are in NK, you, we know that the W tildes or the sum of them is non-zero, so we can divide through by them. And um, apparently uh, in the physics literature, this is a well-known condition for the existence of a plasmon. So that's uh, uh, some kind of... Uh, 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 wave that's concentrated on the interface. Right, um, and if we don't really have an interface at all, right, uh, then there are no, or the, the, the sets NK are going to be empty, um, as one can quite easily see from the, uh, the equation, right? Uh, so, um, not sure I should attempt this here, but uh, um, it's very easy to see that uh, NK will be empty if the W's both coincide, right? So uh, right here we we'll, we'll get W squared over 2W. Um, so the omega squared doesn't feature in it. And so then uh, the K squared is, well, it's, yeah. So, so if we go back to the end, K, right? So that's assumed that the W plus and the W minus are not in K squared infinity. Um, and if the two are the same, um, then that equality is going to give that W plus and W minus are both in that interval. So that can't happen. Okay, so I want to uh, give an outline of uh, how to prove uh, these results, right? I mean, uh, in this case, it's all going to be ODE problems, so it's fairly easy to, to do this. So the first step is to show that um, the spectrum is contained in the union of these three sets, right? So effectively, that of course means that if we're outside of these three sets, we have to be able to calculate the resolvent. Um, and so that means we need to satisfy these three equations here on both the positive and the negative half axis. And then we need to make sure that uh, uh, our solution satisfies the divergence and the interface condition. Right now, um, if you solve the first equation for U1, differentiate that and plug it into the, the second equation, then uh, we end up with this equation here for U2, which is of course actually the, the same as for U3, right? And so we can solve this using variational parameters, first of all, um, and here we're using that um, the square root of this term here is uh, in the, has positive real part. So that's what I mean by lying in C plus here. So C plus is the right half plane with positive real part. And so not being in the M sets uh, means 
um, that we have this. Right, and then um, obviously we have to impose the, the interface conditions and uh, um, there's a fair bit of calculation to do, but uh, ultimately one can then see that as long as this equality that appears in the set NK uh, is not satisfied, uh, then we get a unique solution here. Right, so we can explicitly solve this. Right, now let's look at the, the eigenfunctions in the set NK. Right, so um, the eigenfunctions have the, the following form. Right, so again, we've got this, this mu plus minus is the k squared minus w plus or minus and the square root of this, which uh, in the set NK are going to lie in the positive right half plane. Um, so the maybe I shouldn't have taken to psi here. I think I formulated things in terms of u previously. So the psi three satisfies um, a second order equation. Let's just go back to the previous slide, right? So we're basically looking at these three equations with right hand side zero now. Um, and both the u3 and the u3 prime had to be continuous on the interface, right? And so that gives us that the, the third component is going to be zero. Um, Whereas the U2 didn't satisfy as many conditions, right? So that's why we end up with uh, still having uh, these uh, non-trivial solutions here for the, the first two components, right? Um, but to, to satisfy the interface conditions, one then requires the, the equation of three here, right? So that means we have to like rely on the set NK. Right, and simplicity we get from uh, looking at uh, this solution psi that we have, right, and we show that it's not perpendicular to the kernel of the um, adjoint operator. So the adjoint operator in this case is one that's basically of the same form, right, you just replace W by its complex conjugate, and uh, you have to replace K by minus K. Um, but it's an operator of exactly the same form, so we know uh, that elements in its kernel uh, basically have the same form as this, right? And so we can show that the psi is not orthogonal uh, to those, right? Which means that the psi does not lie in the range of, uh, of the operator LK, so we're not going to be able to, uh, to build up any kind of Jordan chain uh, with it, right? So they're all algebraically simple. Right, so the next uh, step is to actually create some uh, vial sequences. So that's what we're going to do in the set M plus and M minus, right? And so our vial sequence is going to look like this. So let's look at the first term first, right? So the phi is just a cutoff function. Right, and I'm looking at the case when omega is in M plus, so we can see that the far or this function is going to be supported near x1 is n squared, right? So this is going off to plus infinity. Um, now we choose the psi here that's multiplied by the phi to be a solution of uh, this equation here because we're in the set M plus, right? Um, we're going to be we're going to have solutions to that. Um, and this extra term here is just there so that the divergence condition is satisfied, right? Um, that's why that's there. So these UNs are, are supported away from the interface, right? Because the support's going off to plus infinity. Um, they satisfy the divergence condition. And uh, well, because this, this main term here, when you apply the operator to it, uh, because of Psi satisfying this equation is going to the main part is going to go to zero. Um, we get that uh, it converges to zero as n goes to infinity, right? So we've got a vial sequence is going off to plus infinity, and you can do the same thing going off to minus infinity if omega is in the set m minus. Okay, now uh, we want to look at the discrete spectrum, right? So what we want to show is that lambda is an isolated eigenvalue 
uh, for this this problem here. So in terms of the T's and the W now again, right? Um, and note that uh, lambda is an eigenvalue for this problem uh, if and only if one. Sorry, lambda is in the resolvent set for this problem if and only if one is in the resolvent set for a scaled problem, right? Where these scaled operators with the superscript lambda um, just have a well, that's the parameter lambda in here. So essentially, you just replace the W by lambda W. Right. Um, and well, this is then also equivalent to saying that the omega is in the resolvent set of a, an operator pencil, which is scaled by this lambda. Right. But by the first result, we certainly know that um, the if we have an omega which is not in uh, the exceptional set or the union of these three sets, uh, then we're in the resolvent set, right? But now all we have is uh, we're scaling, we're just multiplying the W by the lambda, right? And so these sets MK lambda uh, and NK lambda are just the corresponding sets where we replace W by lambda W. Right, and then it's not it's not hard to check that if we have an omega in the set NK, then it cannot lie in any of these sets here. Right, so that's uh, that's what we do here, or at least if we're if we're close enough to one, right? So we only need to show that there's some neighbourhood of the point one such that, uh, uh, apart from the point one potentially itself, uh, the uh, no lambda in this neighbourhood will lie in these sets, right? Um, so we know it's not in omega naught because uh, it's in NK. Um, it's not in the NK lambda because the fact that it is in NK means that uh, this first equality holds, right? But being in NK lambda, because we've got W squared in the numerator and uh, just linearly in the denominator, would have to satisfy the equality with an extra factor lambda in there. And of course, it cannot do that uh, simultaneously. Um, and it's not going to be in the M plus minus K lambda sets because the condition for being in uh, the M plus minus K lambda sets would be that lambda W plus minus of omega uh, is in K squared infinity, right? But omega itself is not in the MK set, so that means W plus minus is in the complement of K squared infinity, which is an open set. Uh, so for lambda close enough to one, also lambda times W is going to still be in that open set. Okay, so that gives us the discrete spectrum. Type. Okay. Uh, what time roughly should I finish? <laughs> In 10 minutes. Okay, right. Um, okay, um, so um, I think pretty much the last part we need to prove is all of the essential spectra coincide and are given by this union of the M sets. Right, so what we've shown so far is that the union of these M sets is uh, contained in the Vile spectrum. We've shown that the NK spectrum is the discrete spectrum. And we also know that the spectrum itself uh, is contained in the union of these sets. Of course, the first two means that, that these sets are all contained in the spectrum. So we definitely get equality in the last line here. Um, then uh, well, the Weyl spectrum is a subset of this E5 essential spectrum, and we know that that is disjoint from the discrete spectrum, and so that means that uh, actually uh, we get equalities in all of these, uh, these lines here. Right, so the only thing that's left is that to show that this, uh, this first definition of the essential spectrum actually coincides with all the others as well. Okay, um, so let's assume we are in the, the second version of the essential spectrum. Well, we know that uh, the kernel is, at, I'm going to say finite dimensional, it's actually at most one dimensional, right? So um, if omega is actually in this uh, sigma E2 set, then that means that the, the range of the operator LK omega cannot be closed, right? Because it definitely has finite dimensional kernel. 
So it doesn't have closed range. And so therefore, um, it actually already has to lie in the, the E1 version of the spectrum. Right, because the, the condition that it's failing is, is uh, already a condition to lie in E1. Uh, okay, so yes, so the, the sigma E2 and the sigma vial coincide. Yes, I should have added that somewhere, but uh, that, that's, uh, that's why that's coming in here, right? So uh, we've shown that the vial spectrum essentially, by the arguments above, has to coincide with uh, the sigma E5, and so then because the vial spectrum is the same as sigma E2, it's just the E1 that potentially could be different. Okay, um, so now we've got the exceptional set, right, which in some ways mathematically is maybe more interesting. Um, so uh, let's not look at the case k is zero, first of all, right, so if we are in the exceptional set, um, then we can actually still be in the um, resolvent set, right, so remember the exceptional set means that either W plus or W minus is zero, right? But of course, if omega is zero itself, uh, we can be in that situation with all the W tildes are non-zero, right? And if uh, both W plus, W minus, and this, their sum, if all of those are non-zero, then we actually lie in the uh, resolvent set here, right? And the proof is very similar to uh, proof for how we calculated the resolvent uh, for the, the other points previously. Right, now if um, the only difference here is that the sum of the, the W tildes is now actually equal to zero, uh, then we get a uh, finite dimensional kernel, it's actually a one dimensional kernel here, right, because well, the fact that this is equal to zero means that, uh, well, one of the parameters that we could uniquely determine in this first case here in the resolvent set uh, is undetermined, right? So we still have a, a free parameter, and so we do get a kernel element. Um, we also have uh, infinite dimensional uh, kernels, namely if either W tilde plus or the W tilde minus is zero, right? So how do we get this? So basically what we look at, let's say the W plus tilde is zero. So we take a function which is uh, entirely supported in the positive half plane, right? Uh, we take one which is basically a gradient of uh, another function, right? And so that means its curl will vanish. Um, and because the W tilde plus is zero, there's no divergence condition active. So we don't get any restriction at all from the divergence condition because that will automatically be satisfied. And so we end up with a, an infinite dimensional space of uh, any gradient that is uh, just supported in, the, in that half plane. Right, so... Um, most of the essential spectra coincide. So the second, third, and fourth version, and of course the second version is the same as the vial one. So they coincide and are just given by this, this set here where one of the W tildes vanishes, right? But the sigma E1 is now potentially different, right? So it's where one of the W tildes vanishes, but the W or, or the, the other W uh, has to satisfy the additional conditions. So the other W has to lie in K squared infinity. Right, whereas the, the fifth version of the essential spectrum, so this is the largest one, um, well, it's the whole set omega naught unless uh, zero is in the resolvent set, in which case you just take out that uh, one. Right, but... Uh, Okay, so uh, there's another statement here. So the discrete spectrum in this case is empty. Um, 
So maybe I'll, I'll not say anything about the k equals zero case, right? So that nothing too much happens in, in that case in the exceptional set, right? Um, so in the exceptional set, we do have uh, some things that we don't get outside it, right? So um, most of the, uh, the spectrum in the essential set is independent of k, right? The only place where the k enters, if I go back here, is in this sigma E1, right? Where the W minus or the W plus needs to be an element of K squared infinity, right? And the other thing is that the essential spectras do not always all coincide, right? So um, if we do have omegas such that um, one of the omega tildes is zero um, and the other one is outside of this, uh, this half line, um, then we have points in sigma E2, which are not in sigma E1, right? And we also get points in sigma E5, which are not in sigma E4, right? And that's this, uh, this potential uh, finite dimensional uh, eigenvalue that we can get, right? So both of these can be uh, non-empty. So we genuinely have different essential spectra in the essential set, uh, in the exceptional set. Okay, um, so maybe I'll go fairly quickly through the 2D case, um, right, there's uh, probably uh, nothing too much unexpected happens here. Um, so again, we look at uh, an operator pencil, which is defined very similarly to proof 4, right, just now we have the, this two-dimensional gradient rather than the, uh, the gradient K uh, that we previously had, right, the domain. Um, we want the fields to curl and the curl curl of the fields to lie in L2 and the divergence condition to hold and the range space uh, again is just a diver divergence condition in the domain of course the W tilde enters in the range it does not. Right so now we end up with uh, these three sets here so the M plus and the M minus uh, consists of those omegas where the W plus or minus are in naught infinity and the set N consists of the W plus W minus, uh, so that they're not in uh, zero infinity. And we have this equality here, which is uh, very similar to the one that we saw before previously, rather than A, we had K squared here, All right? So now this equality has to hold for some non-negative A. Right, so the reduced spectrum uh, is again given now by the union of these three sets. Uh, however, we don't have any point spectrum anymore. So in some sense, the, uh, uh, the, the eigenfunctions are smeared out um, and we, we end up getting an essential spectrum also from the, the set N here. Right, and uh, in all of the uh, essential spectra coincide um, and in the exceptional set, we don't get as many interesting things happening as in the one dimensional case, right? So the, uh, we're always in the, uh, in the spectrum in this case. Um, we can have infinite dimensional kernels um, if any of these conditions on the w, or w tilde are satisfied. There's no finite dimensional eigenvalues anymore. There's no discrete spectrum. Um, and all of the essential spectra coincide, right? So, um, yeah, I think this is sort of the differences between the, uh, the one and the two dimensional thing that I've already mentioned, right? So the, the eigenvalues vanish in the two dimensional case. Um, so we don't have, uh, we don't have point spectrum apart from this, this exceptional case here, right? And there then eigenvalues of infinitely, infinite multiplicity and all the essential spectra coincide in two dimensions. Right, so maybe one thing to say, so for the two-dimensional case, maybe if I just go back to this, right, the, um, the proof, or well, the main proof here is actually to, well, you first have to prove that the points outside of this set are in the resolvent set, of course, so we construct the resolvent. Um, and then we prove that at all three sets here, we get vial sequences. So you can construct vial sequences going off to plus infinity and minus infinity, that gives you the M plus and the M minus. And then using the, uh, the one-dimensional eigenfunctions that we had previously, which were given eigenfunctions, um, 
you just take uh, those as plane wave solutions and then use a cutoff along the interface. So this N is again going to give you a spectrum along the interface, but in this case, uh, um, you have Baal sequences that go off to infinity uh, in the X2 direction. Okay, so uh, that's all I have to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Very much. So questions for Ian, either from our live audience or from our virtual one. Yep. Um, so in, in this case, the 2D case, uh, you say the reduced spectrum, there, there are no eigenvalues at all. Uh, no, so, so, so this is the exceptional set, right? So the reduced spectrum is, is this one. Uh, so there's the, the point spectrum is empty here. Right. There's no eigenvalues at all in the two um, case. I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just trying to think that how that corresponds to the work that we did with Giovanni Alberti. I mean, th there was nothing in there, for example, that would have said that if you have uh, a, an interface between two regions that the, 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 the point spectrum is empty in that case, is there? I mean, is, and what I'm getting at is, is, is this an artifact of, of, of imposing the divergence conditions? Divergence conditions weren't there, which they were not in our paper with Alberti. Could, could you still get eigenvalues? Um, I guess so. I haven't thought about that. But I mean, so the, the paper with Alberti was about the essential spectrum, then, wasn't it, too? So um, it, it, it we was. did have infinite multiplicity eigenvalues yes. coming up in some cases. We did, um, yes. Yeah, uh, so probably, yeah. yeah, so we'd get rid of those if you impose the divergence condition, I okay. guess. Yeah. yeah, I was just trying to understand where they've gone. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. More questions? I mean, maybe to add to that in some sense, of course, um, the, the W tilde as being zero is removing the divergence condition, right? So, so in the exceptional set, we do have infinite dimensional eigenvalues. So that, that sort of corresponds to uh, taking away the divergence condition, I guess. Um, so that was somewhere here. Um, this is, these are the eigenfunctions in the one dimensional case, right? So the, the third component is just zero and then the Psi one and the Psi two uh, are just uh, uh, exponentially decaying uh, functions away from the interface, which have the appropriate matching conditions that they you choose the coefficients to match, to get the, uh, the interface conditions to match. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, in 2D, the interface is infinite. So, yeah, these, these would no longer lie in L2 if you go in the, that extra dimension. And so then, yeah, you, you construct the, the vial sequence in the two-dimensional case by taking things like this and multiplying by a cutoff in the X2 direction. Um, and then that gives you a vial spectrum there. I would assume so, yes. Um, it's not something we've looked at, but that, that sounds very plausible, yeah. Further questions? Do we have any questions from the question from the chat? If there are no further questions, then let's thank Ian again for the very nice talk. See you next week.